Loss of proteostasis refers to a disruption in the normal regulation and maintenance of protein homeostasis within a cell or organism. I appreciate that this hallmark does share a lot of similarities with some of the previous ones, and that's kind of the point. All of these hallmarks have a significant area of overlap, so there's going to be some repetition moving forward. Proteins are vital for a ridiculous number of processes in our body. These processes include, but are not limited to, protein transport, structural support, cell signaling, gene expression, coagulation metabolism, immune response, neurotransmission, enzymatic reactions, you get the point. In order for one to maintain homeostasis, it is vital that the proteins of the body are able to successfully carry out their function. However, there are a number of ways in which this homeostasis can be dysregulated. Aging cells accumulate damaged and misfolded proteins through a functional decline in their protein homeostasis machinery, leading to reduced cellular viability and the development of protein misfolding diseases, as can be seen in both Alzheimer's and Huntington's. Proteins are made up of four levels of structures, which build upon the previous level. The primary structure of a protein refers to the linear sequence of amino acids that make up the protein chain. This sequence is determined by the genetic code and is essential for defining the protein's unique identity and function. A change in even a single amino acid in the primary structure can lead to significant alteration in the protein's properties. The secondary structure describes the local folding patterns within the protein chain. The two most common types of secondary structures are alpha helices and beta sheets. These structures are stabilized by hydrogen bonds between the backbone atoms of amino acids. Secondary structure elements contribute to the overall three-dimensional structure of the protein. Alpha helices are often stabilized by hydrogen bonds. The hydrogen bonds form between the carbonyl oxygen of one peptide bond and the amide hydrogen of another, creating a helical structure. This type of secondary structure contributes to the overall tertiary structure as these helices fold and interact with other elements of the protein. Beta sheets also involve hydrogen bonding between adjacent strands. Tertiary structure refers to the three-dimensional spatial arrangement of the entire protein molecule. It results from the folding and interactions of secondary structure elements and other parts of the protein chain. Tertiary structure is crucial for the protein's specific function and is determined by a variety of chemical interactions, including hydrogen bonds, disulfide bonds, hydrophobic interactions, and ionic interactions. Hydrogen bonds are a type of dipole-dipole attraction. This means that electrons are not shared between the two molecules, as is seen in covalent bonding. In a polar molecule, one which has an uneven distribution of electrons, there is separation of electric charge. This uneven distribution of electrons creates a partial negative charge at one end and a partial positive charge at the other. The attractive force between a hydrogen atom to a highly electronegative atom, such as oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine, forms this bond. Hydrogen bonds can be seen in multiple areas of DNA structure. It is hydrogen bonding that forms between an hydrogen atom to an oxygen or nitrogen atom between nucleotides. It is also why GC regions, that is, the interaction between the bases guanine and cytosine, are particularly relevant when it comes to discussion about breaking the two DNA strands apart. Guanine and cytosine are held together by three hydrogen bonds, whilst the thymine and adenine are held together by two. This is why the temperature required to separate two strands of DNA can vary. Guanine always bonds to cytosine, and adenine always bonds to thymine. The higher the percentage of GC binding in a DNA molecule, the more energy required to break these bonds. Amino acids have what is referred to as R groups. These R groups can be electrically charged, polar uncharged, or have hydrophobic side chains, which contribute to these additional forms of bonding. The overall three-dimensional folding of a protein often involves hydrogen bonds between amino acid residues that are not close in the linear sequence, but come into proximity in the folded structure. These interactions help to hold the tertiary structure together. 
An amino acid residue is a component of a protein molecule. It's called a residue because during the formation of the peptide bond, the water molecule is removed, leaving behind the remaining components of the amino acid. A peptide bond is an amide type of covalent bond linking two consecutive alpha amino acids from carbon one of one alpha amino acid to nitrogen two of another along a peptide or protein chain. Disulfide bonds are specific chemical reactions that occur through oxidation. Oxidation is a chemical reaction that involves the loss of electrons or an increase in the oxidation state of an atom, ion, or molecule. The formation of disulfide bonds involves the side chains of cysteine residues. Cysteine is unique in that its side chain contains a thiol group or an SH group. The thiol group undergoes oxidation to form a disulfide bond. The specific location of cysteine residues in the linear sequence of the protein influences which part of the protein is covalently linked. Hydrophobic interactions are driven by amino acids with hydrophobic side chains, which tend to cluster together in the interior of the protein, away from the surrounding aqueous environment. The hydrophobic R group avoids contact with water by aggregating together in the protein's interior, forming a hydrophobic core. This is often observed in proteins where non-polar amino acids are buried within the structure, shielding it from the aqueous surrounding. The tendency of hydrophobic groups to minimize their exposure to water is a driving force for protein folding. Hydrophobic interactions contribute to the proper folding of the protein, helping it to achieve a thermodynamically stable and functional conformation. Ionic interactions involved the charged R groups of amino acids. Those amino acids with charged side chains can be either positively charged, which makes them basic, or negatively charged, which makes them acidic. In proteins, acidic and basic amino acid side chains can come close together in the folded structure. The positively charged side chain of a basic amino acid can attract and form a salt bridge with the negatively charged side chain of an acidic amino acid. The electrostatic attraction between oppositely charged amino acid side chains contribute to the stability of the protein structure. These interactions are often found on the protein surface or are interfaces between protein subunits. Now, the quaternary structure of a protein is only relevant to those which contain multiple polypeptide chains, also known as subunits. It describes how these subunits interact with each other to form a functional protein complex. Proteins with quaternary structures are often composed of two or more polypeptide chains that work together. The classic example of one of these is hemoglobin, as it is a tetrameric protein composed of four subunits, each with its own tertiary structure. Proteins are synthesized in a linear chain of amino acids, and they have to fold into these specific three-dimensional shapes to function correctly. Misfolded proteins can be harmful to cells and may aggregate, leading to cellular dysfunction. Misfolded or damaged proteins may accumulate and form aggregates. These aggregates can interfere with cellular processes and potentially lead to toxic effects. Cells have mechanisms to degrade and remove damaged or misfolded proteins, but a loss of proteostasis can disrupt these processes, leading to the accumulation of harmful proteins. Aging can also lead to impaired chaperone function. Chaperones are a family of proteins that play a vital role in the stabilization of unfolded proteins. You'll recall earlier that we spoke about histones, the structures that DNA wind around. Chromatin is the complex of DNA and proteins, and histones are proteins around which DNA forms nucleosomes. Histone chaperones are proteins which play a crucial role in the assembly, disassembly, and maintenance of these chromatin structures. Chaperone proteins help other proteins fold correctly and prevent misfolding. Loss of proteostasis can affect chaperone function, leading to protein misfolding. 
accumulation of misfolded or aggregated proteins can trigger oxidative stress and inflammation, which can further damage cells and tissues. Now, if you look back at the rejuvenation roadmap, you would notice a section at the bottom referred to as biomarkers of aging. Biomarkers are measurable indicators or characteristics of biological processes. For instance, in cardiology, biomarkers are used extensively. Following a myocardial infarction, more commonly referred to as a heart attack, cardiac muscles die. This dying tissue results in the release of proteins that allow clinicians to track the time the myocardial infarction. Previously, we've also talked about the Horvath clock, which makes use of DNA methylation as its biomarker. These same principles can be used not only to detect the biological processes that allow us to objectively measure one's biological age, but also factors that can lead to a plethora of other diseases. A major player in this area is that of Amprion. Headed by its CEO, the physician scientist, a title I hope to have one day, Russ Lebovitz. They have developed a propriety technique called Protein Misfolding Cyclic Amplification, or PMCA. This is presently being used to aid in the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. One area that shows immense promise in overcoming loss of proteostasis is next-generation plasmapheresis. Griffles have developed AMBAR, a plasmapheresis technique that infuses patients with human albumin and intravenous immunoglobulin for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. The company's hypothesis was that amyloid beta, the main driver of Alzheimer's disease, binds to albumin in the brain, which can then be removed from the body. The company's results have confirmed that this approach is valid, although it does not constitute a cure. In a phase 2b slash 3 trial, Griffles reports that treated patients with moderate Alzheimer's experience a 61% reduction in disease progression and a 71% reduction of symptoms, with positive results reported for both moderate and mild Alzheimer's sufferers. In addition to this, an area I'm incredibly interested in is the crossing over between computer science and biochemistry. Proteins are made up of hundreds, sometimes thousands of amino acids, and understanding how all of these chemical bonds interact together to form the three-dimensional shape of a protein is a Herculean task. However, artificial intelligence is already being utilized in drug discovery. I hope that it can be used to better understand the molecular mechanisms of proteins so that we are better able to combat proteostasis moving forward.